Hello everyone. This is a presentation on osteoporosis. My name is Garrett Swart. Before we begin, just a quick disclaimer. The information contained in this video should not be considered medical advice. Always consult with your healthcare team and trained medical professionals before making any medical decisions. And this presentation utilizes information from various sources uh, that are cited at the end of the presentation. Um, but all research and information belongs to the original publishers and was compiled for educational purposes. Okay, at this point, um, I'm going to have you guys do a pre-presentation survey. Um, you could get out your phone, use your QR code scanner, scan this box, and it'll take you to the survey in six questions. It's really quick. Um, you could also click the link in the description. Um, you could pause the video at this point and do that, um, and then I'll continue with with the presentation. Thank you. And just a little introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Garrett Swart. I'm a second year physician assistant student at South University, West Palm Beach. This is my presentation for my capstone project uh, for school. And my capstone advisor is Dr. Monique Jaquith. A little bit about me. Uh, I was born in Los Angeles, California. I have a degree in behavioral neuroscience from University of San Diego. Most of my clinical experience before uh, going to PA school was as an EMT on an ambulance and an EMT in the emergency room. Um, and then I decided on a career as a physician assistant. I took all the courses um, and the prerequisites and applied all over. And I got into South University and moved to Florida across the country and embarked on this journey of what I know is going to be a very rewarding career. For those unfamiliar with the physician assistant profession, PAs are healthcare providers who are trained to evaluate patients, diagnose illnesses, and develop treatment plans. And they can work in a variety of different fields and specialties, uh, which make them very valuable in addressing the needs of the community. For this project, we had to choose a topic from Healthy People 2030. Um, just a little bit about Healthy People 2030. It's an initiative under the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, it aims to improve the health and well-being of the public. Um, as you can see here, the overarching goal is to attain healthy, thriving lives and well-being, free of preventable disease, disability, injury, and premature death. Um, so the plan of action is they set these national goals and measurable objectives, and they implement these evidence-based policies and programs and they stimulate research um, uh, in, in hopes to kind of facilitate the development and availability of affordable means of health promotion, disease prevention, and treatment um, to really lessen the impact of preventable diseases over the next decade. So for my capstone topic, I chose osteoporosis. Um, the Healthy People 2030 objective is reducing the prevalence of osteoporosis and related osteoporotic fractures that comes with the, the disease. Um, my target audience is adults 18 to 65, um, but as I will talk about throughout the presentation, bone health is important in all stages of life. Uh, the reason I'm choosing osteoporosis is because it's very common as I'll talk about some statistics, um, it, there's a high mortality rate once fractures do occur and it has a large impact on the healthcare system in terms of cost and it can really sneak up on you. It's typically asymptomatic um, in, up until your first fracture. And I personally chose it because my mother was diagnosed with osteoporosis and so I've seen firsthand the impact it can have on quality of life, especially when fractures occur. Um, she didn't really know much about osteoporosis before she was diagnosed with it. Um, she didn't really find out until her first fracture. And she had a lot of the risk factors of osteoporosis before being diagnosed with it. So I think that by bringing awareness and increasing knowledge about osteoporosis in the community, people can recognize the risk factors and make the appropriate lifestyle changes for good bone health and seek treatment sooner. So there can be a reduction in osteoporosis diagnoses and related fractures in the future. Here are the learning objectives for this presentation. You will learn what osteoporosis is, the pathophysiology, and be able to recognize the risk factors. You'll be able to understand that 
if you are diagnosed with osteoporosis or if you think you might have osteoporosis, who you can talk to, um, what screening is available, and what are the best treatments in mitigating the progression of the disease. Um, you'll also learn how to perform bone strengthening exercises and a little learning activity and the appropriate nutrients for bone health and the foods that contain them and what the recommended daily amount is. So what is osteoporosis? Osteoporosis is a disease characterized by low bone mass and microarchitectural deterioration of bone tissue leading to enhanced bone fragility and a consequent increase in fracture incidence. Uh, so that's the definition, um, but what that means is basically just porous bone that is weak and subjected to minimal force can cause um, fractures. To understand osteoporosis, we need to understand how bones change and grow. Uh, the bony skeleton is an organ that serves both a structural function such as providing mobility, support, protection for the body, and a reservoir function uh, where it stores essential minerals. And it consists of a cortical bone that's on the outside uh, that provides strength and sites for attachment for you know tendons and muscles. And then there's a there's an inner network of bone called spongy bone. And this provides a large bone surface for mineral exchange. Um, and bone is a mineralized connective tissue that exhibits four types of cells. You have osteoblasts, bone lining cells, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. And osteoclasts are what break down the bone, and osteoblasts are what form new bone. So um, these cells are vital to the process of bone modeling. So when you're young, uh, your bones are constantly growing and shifting in space and these cells are responsible for that and in adulthood our bones stop growing but they continue to remodel and um, this remodeling process involves a balance between bone resorption or bone breakdown by the osteoclast and bone formation by the osteoblast Now, many things can interfere with the development of a strong and healthy skeleton, uh, which I'll talk, talk about um, in subsequent slides. Um, but without a doubt, as we age, this remodeling process can shift out of balance, and there's more bone loss than, than bone formation, and that's what leads to osteoporosis. And as you can see here in this picture, we have this healthy healthy bone that has a very thick structure and architecture to it and as we age it becomes more like this as it starts to break down more than it does grow and it becomes porous and weak and that's how um, you become more susceptible to fractures. So to understand how to prevent osteoporosis we have to understand peak bone mass. Peak bone mass is defined as the maximum amount of bone tissue accrued during an individual's life. So we're just going to be looking at this graph here. Um, in childhood, bone remodeling is characterized by a positive bone turnover. So with an overall increase in the amount of new bone formed compared with the levels of bone resorption. So you can see how this there's this increase of bone mass up until about age 30. And then that's when that's when uh, there's an age-related bone degeneration which leads to a net loss of new bone. Uh, men and women typically reach peak bone mass around the same time and uh, men do achieve a higher peak mass on average but around age 40 they both begin to lose bone mass but for women this process accelerates because of menopause and the hormonal changes and the lack of estrogen that causes an increase in, in, in the loss of bone. Um, so it's important for a life, a lifelong bone health and you want to maximize that peak bone mass, especially during uh, uh, critical periods of growth. So that's, that's uh, adolescence and childhood. Um, uh, studies have shown that almost half of adult bone mass is attained during, during that time, especially around puberty. So if you're not optimizing your peak bone mass, um, 
and you're not maintaining it in adulthood, you, you put yourself at a higher risk uh, for fragility fractures later in life. Um, in a healthy population, uh, genetics do determine um, around 60 to 80 percent of your peak bone mass, but this trajectory, this predetermined trajectory that you really don't have any control over, can be influenced by modifiable uh, environmental factors. Um, in particular, which we'll, I'll discuss uh, in depth later on, um, is physical activity and optimal nutritional intake of protein, calcium, and vitamin D. And you can see if you don't take care of your bones, you don't reach that peak bone mass, and you can get osteoporosis uh, younger in life and be more at risk for, for those um, fractures. Here are some population statistics about osteoporosis, just to, to show how serious and how common osteoporosis is. Uh, the estimated number of adults with osteoporosis and low bone mass was 53.6 million. That's approximately 54% of the US, U.S. population ages 50 years and older. That's a huge number. And then since I'm in Florida, I focus on Florida statistics. So here it shows about 20% um, of Medicare beneficiaries in Florida died within one year following a new osteoporotic fracture. And this increased to 30% when the hip was involved. And approximately 20 to 50% of hip fracture patients require long-term nursing home care. This has a huge impact on, on, on one's life and decreases quality of life, including social isolation, depression, and loss of self-esteem, as I will discuss in the next slide here. Here you can see the impact of osteoporosis. The most prevalent sites for osteoporotic fractures are the hip and spine. So one of these fractures occurs, it can really impact daily life. Um, you'll have difficulty with activities of daily living. This is just getting out of bed, getting dressed, taking showers, cooking food, um, being able to walk uh, independently. Um, that's why so many um, individuals enter nursing homes after their first osteoporotic fracture, which leads to being bed bound and pressure ulcers and just an overall impaired quality of life. It also has an impact on the healthcare system. Of the 2 million osteoporotic fractures per year in the U.S., it leads to 400,000 hospitalizations and 200,000 nursing home admissions. Um, and this costs patients and their families and the healthcare system $19 billion annually. And this, this number is only going to increase um, by 2025. So who gets osteoporosis? Um, here's a list of primary and secondary causes of osteoporosis. Uh, the main one being just increasing age um, and, and the female sex because of the, um, the acceleration of bone loss during that perimenopausal period. Um, long, you see here long-term glucocorticoid treatment, so that's steroids. Um, so if you're on long-term steroids, you might want to consult your healthcare provider about getting screened for osteoporosis. And then some modifiable risk factors such as smoking and alcohol intake. Uh, nicotine uh, inhibits bone forming cells, so smoking can reduce bone mass as long with, uh, with alcohol. Uh, there's many things that can interfere with the development of a strong and healthy skeleton, so you want to be uh, mindful of that. There's genetic abnormalities, nutritional deficiencies, um, and hormonal disorders that can all affect the skeleton, um, as well as lack of exercise, immobilization. Um, if you don't use your bones, if you're not um, stimulating your bones with mechanical forces, uh, they're not going to continue to to um, to form new bone. So you want to look at this list and kind of determine if you have any of these risk factors. And if you do, um, you want to talk to a healthcare provider about getting screened. What is the recipe for healthy bones? Um, so as I've talked about, uh, exercise and diet. Um, for exercise, you want to do weight-bearing, high-impact exercises um, and strength training and I'll go deeper into that uh, exactly what exactly that means and then you want to look at your diet you want a well-balanced diet but you want to you want to make sure you're getting enough of the important uh, bone strengthening nutrients such as calcium vitamin D and protein 
Here's the deeper dive into diet and nutrition for bone health. Um, this is calcium, vitamin D, protein. Calcium is the most important mineral for healthy bones. That's because it is a building block of bone and the body needs vitamin D to absorb the calcium. The, although the skin makes vitamin D when it's exposed to the sun, some people still have low vitamin D levels, so you just want to be mindful of that. And you can find vitamin D in the milk you buy, the grocery store, liver, fatty fish, egg yolks. can also contain small amounts of vitamin D. For calcium, you can find it in milk, cheese, yogurt, seafood, leafy vegetables such as kale, turnips, broccoli, and other fortified foods like cereals. And you don't want to forget about protein. You want to get enough protein because that protein has collagen which gives bones a lot of its strength and flexibility. So the daily recommendations for calcium and vitamin D are in this chart on the right here you can see as an adult you should be getting about a thousand milligrams of calcium and about 800 units of vitamin D daily. If you create a diary of the foods you eat and you calculate your daily intake of calcium and vitamin D through the nutrition facts labels and you find yourself not meeting the daily recommendations, you can consult your healthcare provider about possibly starting a multivitamin or a vitamin D supplement. But most of the time you can you can reach these recommendations easily by just eating balanced meals, as I'll show you in the next slide here. Here's an example of a balanced meal. As you can see here, the grilled chicken Caesar salad gets you 42 grams of protein, 300 milligrams of calcium, and 9.25 international units of vitamin D. Um, so you could easily hit the recommended daily value of calcium, vitamin D, and protein by just eating three balanced meals a day and getting a little bit of sun, about like 10-15 minutes of sun will get you enough vitamin D for the day. So it doesn't have to be a huge math equation of if you're getting enough of these nutrients, typically just by eating healthy and eating, eating enough each day, you can hit the marks. Exercise is also vital to bone health. It is especially important in children and adolescents, um, as I previously talked about, um, as their bones have a greater ability to adapt and strengthen in response to mechanical stress. So if exercise is implemented early in life, then individuals can reach a higher peak bone mass by the time they reach 30, and thus reduce their level of risk um, and risk of fracture later in life. So these exercises that stimulate um, the greatest amount of bone growth are weight-bearing, high-impact exercises like running, jogging, dancing, jumping rope, plyometrics, which is like jumping exercises, sports like soccer, volleyball, basketball, gymnastics, ra racket sports, and also things like strength training, resistance training which includes weightlifting and doing different exercise and movements that exert force on muscles, which exert forces on bones, which thus causes bone turnover and new bone is thus deposited. So these exercises work because of the principle of Wolf's Law uh, or the mechanostat theory, which states that our bones will adapt remodel and strengthen with the more stress that's placed on them. So in regions of, of bone experiencing high mechanical loads it becomes consolidated while regions of bone that experience low mechanical loads the bone is removed. So that's why these exercises work. You're putting the mechanical stress necessary to cause and stimulate bone growth or bone maintenance. So for weight-bearing high-impact exercises, you want to do it 30 minutes per day, five days a week, and you want to add some resistance training uh, two days a week with two to three sets of 10 to 12 reps. And you want these 10 to 12 reps, you want to exert yourself, you want, you want that, that 10th rep or that 12th rep to be very difficult to achieve. And I'll discuss all this in in the uh, subsequent video and on the next slide.
but what's important is you want to do 8 to 12 exercises that hit all the major muscle groups because the more muscles that you hit the more bones that you hit Hello there. Thanks for stepping away from the presentation with me to engage in a little learning activity. So we know high impact exercises are effective at bone growth. That's running, sports like soccer, gymnastics, jumping, climbing stairs. It also includes strength and resistance training. The most common osteoporotic fractures occur at the spine, the hip, and the wrist. Therefore, it is important to implement site-specific exercises that strengthen the muscles and thus the bones at those sites. Many studies such as the LIFTMORE trial show that weightlifting and increasing the load on the bones resulted in increased bone density at the spine and the hip. This study included barbell squats, deadlifts, overhead press, and jumping chin-ups. Weightlifting involves complex movements and requires proper form or else injury can occur. So everyone's workout routine should be individualized. So it's important to talk with a physical therapist or a personal trainer before performing these types of exercises. For the sake of appealing to people at all levels of fitness, I'm going to demonstrate simple body weight exercises that can be done at home and without equipment. All right, let's get started. Okay, for the first exercise, we have the squat. So you wanna place your feet, uh, shoulder width apart, so Toes pointed slightly out, opening up the hip joint. You could put your arms out in front of you for counterbalance. So you're gonna engage your core. You're gonna hinge at the hips and sit down like you're sitting in a chair. You come down, you're gonna hold with the thighs parallel um, to the floor, and then you're gonna drive through your heels back up. Now you see it from the side here. Here, engage the core, like sitting back in the chair. And drive through the hip. Now you want to do three to four sets at 10 to 12 reps. If that's too easy, you can always add a weight. All right, on to the next exercise. The next exercise is the push-up. With the push-up, the starting position is going to be a high plank. We're going to engage the core, engage the glutes. You're going to, your feet are going to be about shoulder width apart. Your arms are going to be a little wider than shoulder width apart. And the important thing is there should be, it should be a straight line from your heels to your neck. And then you're going to lower your chest to the ground. Your hips and chest should be moving in one fluid motion, keeping that line straight. You can do three to four sets, 10 to 12 reps. Um, if that's too easy for you, you could include resistance bands or switch to an exercise like the bench press. All right, on to the next exercise. The next exercise is the prone back extension. For this exercise, you're going to be lying flat on your stomach Legs and arms extended, arms are by your side with your palms facing up. So you're gonna lay down like so. Your head and neck are gonna be in a neutral position. You're gonna engage your glutes and then lift your chest, engaging your back muscles and holding at the top for the motion. And then you're gonna come down. And then back up, hold, engaging your glutes and then back down. And you can do this for three to four sets at 10 to 12 reps. It's great for posture and great for activating those spinal muscles in your back. All right, for the last exercise is the plank. So with the plank, you're gonna stack your elbows right below your shoulders, feet shoulder width apart, You want to maintain a straight line from your heels to your neck. You're going to engage your glutes and your core, kind of bringing in your belly button like you're trying to bring in your belly button up towards the ceiling. Engage your, your muscles in your back. So it's a full body tension and you're going to hold. You're going to hold it like that for 30 seconds to a minute. Thanks for joining along with those exercises. Those exercises provide a good foundation. And as you get more comfortable, you can begin to add more weights or do more complex movements. When talking about bone health, in order to strengthen the bones, you have to provide the necessary mechanical force to induce bone formation. So no matter what 
your, your workout routine is, you want to increase resistance and intensity progressively. This is necessary because for bone to form, it requires a minimum amount of strain. Once a bone adapts to a given strain level, the stimulus for that bone to form is removed and a higher strain level becomes necessary for it to adapt further. You also want to use dynamic exercises and vary the exercises hitting all the muscle groups to ensure that all the bones receive stimulus to increase bone mineral density. You also want to train frequently, four to five times a week, and consistency is key to long-term bone health. Like other tissues, bone undergoes both adaptation to training and detraining during periods of inactivity. So the bone remodeling cycle lasts four to six months. This is the minimum period of time needed for bone mineral density to change significantly. So stay consistent with your workouts. Now let's get back to my presentation. Moving on to screening and diagnosis. In order to diagnose osteoporosis, it requires a bone mineral density test. This could be by a thing called a DEXA scan. This is the preferred method. Uh, this test lets you know the amount of bone mineral you have in a certain area of bone. Your bone mineral density, along with personal risk factors, can predict your chance of having a fracture in the future and can help you and your healthcare provider decide if you need treatment. And if you are being treated for osteoporosis, your healthcare provider may repeat the test every year or two and compare the results to see how well your treatment is working. Uh, these tests are, are pretty uh, seamless and, and easy to do. You remain fully dressed, and the test usually takes about 15 minutes. And in the bottom right-hand corner of this picture is kind of looks like what, what it looks like. Your BMD test result is a number called a T-score. It tells you how your bones compare to those of healthy young adults. Uh, the difference between your, your bone mineral density and that of a, a, a healthy young adult is described as a standard deviation. Usually one standard deviation decrease in bone mineral density equals a 10% to 15% drop in bone density. So greater than two and a half standard deviations, so a T-score of minus 2.5 below normal means you have a significant risk for fractures and you have officially been diagnosed with osteoporosis. The recommended screen for osteoporosis is in women 65 years or older or postmenopausal women younger than 65 who are at increased risk of osteoporosis. Now, while these are rec recommendations, if you feel that you have a certain risk factor, like we previously discussed in this presentation, do not hesitate to speak to your healthcare provider about possibly getting screened. So, we've talked about how to prevent osteoporosis in terms of diet and exercise through all stages of life. Uh, for those that, that do get diagnosed with osteoporosis, while it isn't curable, it is manageable, especially if caught early. Um, this includes treating the underlying causes and utilizing uh, medication to slow the disease progression. Here's just a quick little chart that I got from a study that, that just lists some of the first-line treatments, uh, pharmacological treatments for osteoporosis. and just to give you an idea, these main medications belong to two categories. There's anti-resorptives and anabolics. So these anti-resorptive medications, like the ones listed here, like the bisphosphonates, they slow the breakdown of bone. When you first start taking these medications, you stop losing bone mineral as quickly as you did before, but you still make new bone. Therefore, your bone density may increase slightly. Anti-resorptive treatments can prevent further losses in bone, and lower your risk of breaking bones. The studies that I uh, looked into showed that uh, prolia uh, down at the bottom there is very effective at reducing the risk of spine, hip, and other fractures um, and it is, it's a subcutaneous injection that is every six months so people are, tend to be more uh, compliant on that type of medication that they don't have to take daily. And then there's also anabolic medications that speed up bone formation. That's like teriparatide, um, which is also known as uh, Forteo, uh, which is a parathyroid hormone related protein analog. And it's approved for people at high risk for fracture and it's typically given to individuals who already had an osteoporotic fracture. So just that's just to give you a quick idea of what's available to you and so that you can discuss it with your healthcare provider.
Okay, some, some conclusions um, of just the statistics that I've discussed today. The average age of osteoporosis is 40 years old. Um, one of two will break a bone due to osteoporosis, and there's about 2 million estimated broken bones every year. And here's a quick wrap-up of everything that I've talked about today. These are the important points uh, to go home with. Uh, peak bone mass occurs by 30, so you want to exercise, eat healthy throughout every stage of life. And you, if you have kids, you want to you um, make sure that they're getting enough exercise. And you want to avoid bad habits such as smoking and alcohol. Uh, you want to get screened if you have risk factors and treat underlying causes of osteoporosis. And you, if you do get diagnosed with osteoporosis, you want to start treatment early to help slow the loss of bone. And for those that may be older, have osteoporosis, osteoporosis and have already had some fractures, so they're, they're limited in their ability to, to exercise consistently, you just really want to reduce your risk of falling. And you do that um, by making changes to your home to help prevent you fall. You want to remove obstacles and it adds safety features such as grab bars and non-slip mats and just focus on, on bal balance exercises. Um, so I hope that you leave this presentation knowing a little more about osteoporosis and make the necessary changes uh, to your life so that you can reduce your risk of, of ever getting osteoporosis. Before you go, if you can just do a post-presentation survey, um, use your QR uh, scanner on your phone to do uh, scan the box here. I'll take you to a post presentation survey, which is pretty much the same as the pre, but I just want to see if you've learned anything today. And you can also hit the link in the description below um, if you don't have a QR code scanner. And thank you so much for listening. And I, I really do hope that uh, you've learned at least something from me today. Here are my references. And thank you so much. Have a nice day.